scriptures and to say some things that may be of value to the testimony. Now tonight we're going to look at the spread of the gospel and the planting, how a New Testament assemblies commenced. We'll begin our reading in Luke chapter 24. The commission in the four <coughs> gospels is interesting, but we'll read Luke's commission or the commission that the Lord gave in Luke's gospel. <coughs> Luke's gospel chapter 24. Verse 45, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now let us turn to Acts 1 once again. The book of the Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 4, and being assembled together, notice how it ties in with Luke 24, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now look down at verse 8, but ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Here we have the program laid down so clearly for the spread and the witness of the gospel and the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the next reading is in chapter 8. The 8th chapter. After the stoning of Stephen, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house, and healing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And down this chapter we have the type of preaching they did. They preached the word, they preached Christ, and they preached the Lord Jesus. They preached salvation preaching of the gospel going out. Now let us turn to the 11th chapter. These that were indwelt by the Spirit at Jerusalem and are now going home to the various countries and districts that we read about in chapter 2. Verse 19. Now Acts 11 and 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was, uh, was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man, 
and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church or in the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church, which was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius and Serene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Now the Lord will bless to us the reading of his precious word. We finished last night with the first assembly being planted in this world in the day of salvation. And we read that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and in the fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. The great purpose of the planting of that first assembly was first of all that God might have worshippers. An assembly's preeminent object and being in this world is to be a worshipping people. And our worship is in heaven, but we gather together on earth. And in every gathering, we don't restrict it to the Lord's Supper and all the gatherings of the Lord's people. We come to worship God the Father and to sing praises to the Son and to give adoration and thanksgiving to God for his unspeakable gift. So the assembly moves in a worshipful spirit before we go out to witness to man. There's a great principle in the Word of God going inside to worship and then going out to carry the gospel. Now, in the gospels, the Lord Jesus gave the great commission. And in the four gospels at the end, we have that commission mentioned. And in each of them, it's mentioned in a different way. But in order to arrive at the conclusion, what we are to do while he's away, we must be conversant with the program that he has in mind for the world. When we read in Mark's gospel, for instance, chapter 16, we read, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But we're not told what that gospel is. But we are told the results of the message. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Tells us that we have a responsibility to preach the gospel in the ears of men, in the whole wide world, wherever there's a sinner, and that that sinner comes on to ground of responsibility. If he believes the gospel that we preach, he will be saved. If he rejects that gospel, he will be damned. What a solemn thing it is to listen to the gospel and to preach the gospel of the grace of God. In Matthew, I have another commission I'm not going to mention. And in John, we also have the commission again. But here in Luke chapter 24, we have the clearest terms of what we should do in the preaching and spread of the gospel. By the other commissions, we wouldn't know exactly what the message would be and what the preeminent theme of the message would be. But Luke gives us the preeminent theme. And the Lord Jesus said that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name 
on the authority of his name in all the nations, among all people, beginning at Jerusalem. And then he gives the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit to assist us. They preach the gospel in the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now notice the terms of the gospel. Two great themes. Repentance. The change of mind that we mentioned last night. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle said when he called the elders from Miletum, uh, to Miletum from Ephesus, he said, this was what I preached, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name. On what grounds? On the grounds that Christ suffered and rose again the third day and made a full atonement, and we are to go out with the gospel. The assembly is not only to be a place of worship, but it is the center of divine witness. Now I began to read again before he ascended that he goes over another commission to them very clearly. And he said they were to begin at Jerusalem. Then they were to move to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel was to be spread abroad. And the book of the Acts is the witness of the gospel carried by various men, by individuals, carried by honorable men that had the confidence of their brethren with the message of the gospel, the plain message of the gospel. And they went forth and it began at Jerusalem. And then it reached finally to Rome. And Paul with a chain in his hand is still preaching the gospel in the very last chapters, the book of the Acts. It's the spread of the gospel. And that gospel is still being spread. And assemblies are the beacons. Assemblies are the places where there should go forth divine witness to the whole wide world. There's a sad thing that a third of the world has never heard, the story of the cross. And around us here in Michigan, there are whole cities where there are no testimonies. And there are whole communities where very few are being saved. We thank God for all men that preach the gospel, but it is vested in assembly testimony, the responsibility to bring the gospel, to witness. And every one of us can be witnesses, privately and personally. But then the combined witness of the assembly, reaching out over our borders, that we might see souls saved to be in heaven, and little companies planted to adorn the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is what I want to speak about tonight, how the gospel spread. And so I have read here in these opening verses the meaning of spreading the gospel. Now Jerusalem was a large assembly. We read here of the numerics of that place and how many were saved, 3,000 baptized, a large assembly. And a little later, 5,000 others were saved. And so at least in the assembly of Jerusalem at one time, there were 10,000 believers, as I see it, baptized and gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus. And they were enjoying the breaking of bread. And they were enjoying the Bible study. And they were enjoying the apostles that were amongst them. And they enjoyed many benefits. And the great grace was upon them all. And they had great blessing amongst them in Jerusalem, but they forgot the commission. Not any have gone out, and it's going on now for almost two years, and no one has gone to carry the gospel to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. They're all sitting smug and enjoying things, and carrying on, and having ministry, and the worship, uh, the Lord's Supper, but there's no move with the gospel. Isn't that a sad thing? And you know there are large assemblies still and smaller ones too. And as long as people are coming to the assembly and we're enjoying much of his favor and blessing, then we forget that we're here not only to enjoy the comfort of the assembly, but we're here to be witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Witnesses to Christ. First of all, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's why I read in Acts chapter 8 
Here comes a change for the Jerusalem assembly, that large assembly, likely the largest that was ever in the world, the first assembly. And soon there's going to be no one there, just the apostles. Just in a very few months, that large assembly is stripped right down until there's only the apostles remaining in it. A man came all the way from Ethiopia, but there were no open airs. The great open airs where hundreds were saved, he didn't find. And he found no one to tell him the way of salvation. He was an anxious soul, Ethiopian eunuch, come all the way. He never received anyone to tell him the way of salvation. There was no one in the street corners preaching the gospel as was a few years before, a few months before. They're all gone. And there's just the apostles. They were all scattered abroad except the apostles. The stoning of Stephen came about and the cruel persecution of Saul of Tarsus entering into every house and hailing both men and women. And the persecution was a great persecution. And the claver house of those days was one day to be a man that would carry the gospel himself and would be the most faithful of all men that God ever had in this age of grace. I'd love to speak to you about the biography of Saul of Tarsus and the whole story of his life as outlined in the New Testament. But I'm convinced that God never had a more faithful man a more honorable man, a man with a heart for assemblies and a man with a heart for sinners, reaching out while he was weak uh, in his body. He traveled more miles than anyone else. It's quite interesting when we look at various parts of Paul's anatomy that is mentioned, it begins with his feet. They laid the garments at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul. And those feet that were the, the one that kept and guarded the garments of the murderers. Those feet were to walk further than any other man has ever walked to carry the gospel. Yet he was weak. He traveled, Reader's Digest says, over 5,000 miles by foot in his journeys. When I was first saved, I studied the journeys of the apostle and traced them and watched as he moved from place to place and lay out in the night, hungry, and was beaten with rods, and spent time in the deep waters, and bore in his body the brand marks of the Lord Jesus. Those very feet at whose feet lay the garments of those who stoned Stephen were feet that one day would be snapped into the irons and screwed up in the stocks. And as he lay with wounded feet in that dungeon at Philippi, he would remember that at those feet once lay clothes when he himself was an accessory to murder and had raised his hand and voted against the noble Stephen. And so the life of Paul is a marvelous life and it's one that is well worth studying by all the believers. The biographies of all these men, by the way, in the gospel, in the Book of the Acts, they're named, and each one of them is worthy of study. And I always compare men at the beginning of the Bible and at the end sometimes when I'm studying them. And I think in chapter 7, when I read of Stephen, my mind goes back to Abel. The first martyr, Abel, for his faith. The first martyr of this age, Stephen. And we link them up and we see that God had faithful men in all the ages. And they carried the word of God in the book of the Acts. And so here we have the scattering of these people. But you know, God was behind that scattering. God never intended them to stay in Jerusalem and enjoy the breaking of bread and the ministry. They had forgotten the world. And so this tribulation that came and the persecution was so severe that men with their wives and their little ones, they rose up to leave and to get back into other parts of the country. Some of them had come up to the feast and had stayed over evidently, had joined that assembly, were in that assembly, and they never returned since the day of Pentecost. They'd been away quite a while, almost two years. But now it's scattered, and they begin to leave. 
And I began in Acts chapter 8, how that Philip went down into Samaria, never intended to go there. Philip went down into Samaria and preached Christ. And we see these men leaving Jerusalem and they're going south and east and north and west. They're going out with the gospel and they're carrying it out. God had emptied the assembly of Jerusalem because they did not witness. And now he's forcing them out and they're going to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's how I view Acts chapter 8, the beginning of the witness. Now I come to Acts 11, because I want to speak here about the commencement of the second assembly in the world at Antioch. The first assembly that was ever known was Jerusalem. And there were no other assemblies planted around Jerusalem. And there were no other assemblies planted until this assembly was planted at the commencement of the assembly at Antioch. And Antioch became the very center of the spread of the gospel. It's from this place that the gospel reached out to Europe. We should be so thankful that the gospel came to the West, came to Europe, came to Philippi, and reached out to the Western world. If it had gone east, if God had sent Paul eastward to the Far East, or wherever it would be, we would be in the darkness today that is, encompasses those eastern lands. But the gospel came west. In fact, every movement of God in the Bible is from east to west. Remember at the birth of the Savior, wise men came from the east to the west. Everything moves from the east to the west in relationship to God's work in the reading of the scriptures. And so they are sent with the gospel. And we see men moving with the gospel. Now these men that I commenced to read about in Acts 11, they were not trained servants. They were not men that had great experience, these men that came back from Jerusalem. But I read the lovely words in Acts chapter 11 about them. Always touches my heart when I read this. Now they which were scattered abroad, verse 19, upon the persecution that arose, traveled to Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. They preached the word to Jews. These men were all of Jewish extraction, and they preached the word to the Jews. But in the next verse it says they did something that we have never read of before. They began to preach the Lord Jesus to the Gentiles. They preached the word to the Jew and they preached Christ to the Gentiles. This is the first preaching of the gospel to Gentiles in the Bible, the preaching of these men. As they come down through the country, they stop with Jewish men and they open the Bible to them, the, the scriptures. These men knew the word. When we meet people that know the word, we preach the word. But when they came to the Grecians, they had never seen the word. And so to them, they preached the person. These are the two things that we preach to both Jew and Gentile. We preach the word and we preach the person. The word points to the person. But if people haven't got the living written word, then by word of mouth, we tell them of the Savior. We preach Christ. Wherever these men went, they preached the word and they preached the Lord Jesus as the only Savior. And this is what they needed and what we need too when we preach the word. The hand of the Lord worked with them. And we read these lovely words, a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. This is the first soul winning program of the assembly. The assembly of Jerusalem, they've been scattered. Men go away back to where they came from, their own districts and homelands, and on the way they're touched. You shall be witnesses unto me in Samaria, in Judea. We see Philip going down into Samaria, but these men are going to the uttermost parts of the earth. And as they pass by and meet fellow Jews, they said, we want to read the Bible and show you that Jesus is the Messiah and that he died on Calvary. And then they meet Greeks the first time they're preaching to Gentiles now, and they're telling them about the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And that's really what we need in our gospel meetings. The hand of the Lord 
working with them. The hand of the Lord began to work. When the hand of the Lord worked, a great number turned and believed and turned unto the Lord. And now there's a group of believers in the city of Antioch. Something had never been there before. And Antioch was a great city, one of the great metropolises. I told you that in Luke's gospel, it's the gospel of villages and the Lord moving in villages. But in the book of the Acts, the Lord moves in cities into Antioch, Corinth, Thessalonica, Philippi, Thessalonica and Philippi, and Berea and Athens, the Lord in the cities. And here's the first city outside of Jerusalem, a Gentile city, a wicked city, a city of wealth and affluence, one of the great metropolises at that time. And here are men saved at Antioch, and they're gathering together. I believe that after they were saved, they came together and gathered together, and an assembly was planted in Antioch. And when tidings of these things reached back to the apostles, you'd have thought they would have risen up and said, we'll go ourselves. But they still stayed in Jerusalem. The apostles didn't move at all at that time. But they decided that they would send one man amongst them. And this man, Barnabas, what a wonderful character he is. He's one of the good men of the Bible. In fact, there's only two good men called good men in the New Testament, Barnabas and Joseph of Arimathea. Both of them were Joseph's because Barnabas was Joseph, was his original name, but the believers called him Barnabas, the son of consolation. And so these two men, Joseph, the two Josephs are good men. This Joseph is the man that will preach the risen Christ. The other Joseph is the man that buried the Savior when he died. Two Josephs. And here's Barnabas, a good man. And in the book of Psalms and Proverbs, there are seven things said about a good man. And it fits Barnabas exactly. A good man lendeth. A good man is generous and lendeth. The first time we read of Barnabas, he was a wealthy man. He was like Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man that gave his tomb. This Barnabas was a rich man with land, although he was a Levite, he had land that he shouldn't have had as a Levite, according to the law of Moses, but he sold his property and he brought it and laid it at the disciples' feet, a large sum of money to help the cause of God. And they called him the son of consolation. A good man's path is ordered by the Lord. The foot of a good man is ordered by the Lord. His path is under divine ordering. And so the assembly at Jerusalem when they gathered and the apostles spake about this news about a happening away in Antioch that through personal evangelism men had been saved. I want you to notice something here that the gospelers, the men that went with the gospel at that time, they're unknown as to their names and they had no invitation to preach the gospel. And it gives me a clue to what gospel preaching is all about. Gospel preachers went with the gospel. They went uninvited. No one sent them a letter inviting them to come to Antioch to preach the gospel. They went with the gospel. And they went into new places. They went where the gospel was not known. They went with the gospel. Nobody invited them. They had an exercise before God to carry the gospel. And I believe that's what true evangelism is. Evangelism is not waiting for an invitation to come to a, an assembly that's ready to have uh, people come and have kind of church meetings uh, inside their doors. An evangelist is one who goes with the gospel to a village, to a farmyard, to a tent, to some place out in the country. When God sends a man to be an evangelist, he's not sending to a conference to minister. It's most, much mistaken today. People imagine when a man has a letter as an evangelist, that's his cue to be at a large conference. And it's his cue to be going all around the country to assemblies from door to door, not at all. When one is called to be an evangelist, he reaches out 
Now, I'm not speaking about something I didn't do myself in my young days. The first place I went was to the open air in the town where I was brought up. I asked the brethren, I said, there's no open air here. Would the brethren be in fellowship with me if I went out to the street corner and stood at that street corner and preached the gospel? And they said, all right. And I went, the first night I was there, I was there alone. But by the end of a month or two, there was 40 young men came. And we stood there for many, many years at that corner. I had an appointment there every Saturday night. And then up in the hills and the valleys and barn lofts and places like that, we went with the gospel. Nobody invited us. I just went out into the country and rented a hall there and started meetings and preached the gospel and saw people saved in those early days, many of them in the work today throughout this world, men that we, that all of you know by name, are reached in those type of little gatherings of the Lord's people, town hall meetings and orange hall meetings and wherever we could get in, preach the gospel, the grace of God. It's a wonderful thing. This is what happened here that men were exercised. They weren't exercised to run around assemblies and preach at conferences and so on. They were exercised to go out and get into some little, even even it was only a man's house, and get a few people together and tell them the story of the cross, evangelism. You know, we've drifted far from that pattern today. But these men went to preach the gospel. But now there's a work in Antioch, and people are saved and baptized. And these men fade from the picture. They were evangelists, but they weren't pastors. They weren't shepherds. And this company needed a shepherd. And so the assembly at Jerusalem, they discussed it, and they said, we'll send Barnabas. He's the best man we could send, for he's a son of consolation. He's a man with a gentle spirit. He's a man with a gracious spirit. And we'll send them down to investigate. They didn't send them down to put the stamp of their approval and say this is an assembly. You know an assembly is not recognized by another assembly. It's God that plants an assembly. And when God plants an assembly and he recognizes it, then the other assemblies, they appreciate what God has planted. Today, there seems to be in places a kind of a hierarchy that somebody must set his stamp of approval upon it before it can be recognized as an assembly. It's God's assembly. And when God plants an assembly, people will recognize that's of God. That's not a break away from somewhere else. It's not a number of men that couldn't get on in their own assembly and went down the road and started a little place of their own where they would be able to rule the roost. That's not what an assembly is. An assembly is planted by the gospel. A true assembly has a birth, like Philippi had a birth, Thessalonica had a birth, Corinth had a birth. All these assemblies were born through the preaching of the gospel, and there were baptized believers gathered to the name and person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is primitive Christianity that needs to be emphasized today in our day. And so here we have what took place now. A Barnabas came. Now notice, the gospel preachers went, but Barnabas was sent. He was sent. The assembly at, Thessalon at Jerusalem talked this over and they said, there's a great work going on in Antioch and we would need to send someone down, not to investigate it, but to be a help to it if it's a genuine work. And who among us will go? And there were all the apostles there and they saw Barnabas, and they said, this is a man that has a shepherd's heart. I've often said, in this light of the, this early assembly, we see coming to light the man with the hook, the fisherman sent. A fisherman takes the hook, and these men went with the hook, they caught fish. They were fishermen. I will make you become fishers of men. But after the hook, we need the crook. And Barnabas takes the crook of the shepherd and he moves in the direction of Antioch, wondering what he would find when he would come there. And when he came there, 
He hadn't won one soul to the Lord. But when he came there and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. As he saw the work of God, that unknown men whose names never were in a magazine or anywhere else, they have gone with the gospel. They have seen a work done. And he comes now at the commencement. Now he comes to consolidate, to confirm what God has planted. And he came, and when he saw the grace of God, he was glad. And as he looked at those young converts, he exhorted them all. Reminds me of Daniel, that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and much people were added unto the Lord. The assembly is growing. And they had meetings, and they broke bread. And the, it was an assembly recognized by God in heaven. And the Lord was being honored. The Lordship of Christ in this lovely passage is a good man full of the Holy Ghost. And much people were added unto the Lord. He saw people saved. The Lordship of Christ was owned. A beautiful assembly is now planted in Antioch. But Barnabas one day as he looked at it, he said, men came with a hook. They, were, they went with the gospel. I came with a crook. I was sent by another assembly to look into the work and care for them. But he said, what we need now is a man with a book to teach them. These are the things we need. We need the hook, the crook, and the book. By hook or by crook, let us go by the book. Nice, isn't it? And so here we have the idea of a man with a book. And so, as he sat down and thought, who could I bring? This time, the man that teaches will be invited. Notice what I'm saying now, carefully, what the Bible teaches. The man with the gospel, he goes without anyone inviting him. Chooses a place where he might see a soul or two saved. The evangelist going out, the hook. This man, the shepherd, is sent by brethren to shepherd the flock. They own his ability to do it. But the assembly had nothing to do with a man coming, coming to preach the gospel, and they had nothing to do with this man that came to shepherd them. But they have all to do with inviting someone that knows the book to teach the word of God to open the scriptures. And so they had a meeting, and they said, I'm sure that Barnabas said, I know a brother. He's saved now a number of years. You know, Paul was not in the assembly for three years after his conversion. I suppose you know that. He was baptized at Damascus, but there was no assembly. And he went away to study the scriptures. The first time he came to Jerusalem, they wouldn't receive him. Didn't want to receive him. He was three years saved. Wouldn't receive him. Got to read in Acts 9, a little carefully between Acts 9 and Galatians 1, to find it. And Barnabas befriended him and said to the brethren, he's genuine. He was received at Jerusalem. But then after that, he goes away again into the desert. He's studying the scriptures. And Barnabas said, I know that Paul is a man of the book. And I want to go and bring him to this assembly. And so he goes to invite him. He said to the brethren, I'm leaving on a long journey. I'm going to carry your invitation to bring this man to teach the precious word of God. And so he went and brought Paul. And we read these lovely words about it. And he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass a whole year they assembled in the church and taught much people. And there were first called Christians at Antioch. What does that mean? The ministry he gave produced Christ in them. The ministry the apostle gave made them Christ-like. These men of Antioch had never heard the gospel. 
They were heathen. They were in darkness. They became Christ-like. And God, looking down, said, I put a name upon them. That word there, they were first called Christians. The word is they were divinely called Christians at Antioch. You know, that's a, the only proper pronoun for us. We are saints with a small s. We are brethren with a small b. Never call yourself one of the brethren with a capital B. All believers are brethren. All believers are saints. All believers are in the body. All believers are not in an assembly of God. All believers in this age are Christians. Of Christ they speak. For Christ they lived. Of the Christ they sang. And the Christ they loved. They were joined to Christ. And being joined to Christ means that I should become Christ-like. And my attitudes. As he is, so am I in this world. How do we live? Have we the compassion of Christ? Have we the forgiveness of Christ? Have we the gentleness and meekness of Christ? Have we the faithfulness of Christ? Have we the strength of Christ? Are we prepared to suffer as Christ did? Are we prepared to own Christ in the home? Do we own Christ where we work? Do my neighbors know that I'm a Christ-like man? Or will we be gruff and ugly and nasty and abrasive? All the years we're saved should produce Christ-likeness. What we are occupied with should change us. We become like what we look at. What I'm occupied with and what my eye looks upon. What I'm resting upon. What I'm occupied with. What concerns me. What is the object of my living? Other things must take their place. But I want to ask you, are you in love with the one who first loved you? Or is he just a far away figure? Do you enjoy being in his presence and thinking of him? Sitting down quietly in a room by yourself and thinking of the love that gave him and of the prospect that you will soon be with him in the air or in the home above. Christ exalting ministry among the saints. That's what Paul gave. They became like the ministry they heard. They, the features of Christ developed in them to such a degree that while he looked down on the large assembly in Jerusalem, he didn't say these are Christians. No. They looked in this group. Their devotion and love to Christ are called Christians at Antioch. Remember the evangelist went. Remember, the shepherd was sent. Remember, the teacher was invited. But in this assembly now we see something else. We see caring for others. You know, the enmity between Antioch men and Jerusalem men, between Jew and Gentile, it was tremendous in those days. A Jew had no dealings with a Samaritan or with a Gentile or a Gentile with a Jew. And here's a Gentile assembly in Antioch. Strangers. There's poverty in Jerusalem. Great poverty, a dearth, because the prophets have visited them. See, this is another part here that we read. There stood up among them and in those days, certain prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Prophets visited them. One of those prophets said, it's a great dearth in the land. And these saints at Antioch, they said, we must gather up money according to our ability. 
and will send relief. And here we see Barnabas now with Paul, two men, leaving Antioch together. They have ministered of, of spiritual things, and now both of them in their hands are material things. And as they walked along the road, Paul would say, Barnabas, it was wonderful that you came down and saw this. And he said, if you hadn't come, they wouldn't have been taught. And if those men whose names are not mentioned hadn't preached the gospel, there'd be no money in our pockets today. And we're going to Jerusalem where they're starving and we're carrying this money. This is what you call assembly fellowship between two assemblies. Delightful thing. How has this come about? The book of the Revelation chapter 1 shows me that the seven assemblies surround one person. No, you can't produce organized assemblies. You can't draw chains around them or draw cords around them and say, this is it. Outside of that, there's nothing. No, no, you don't do that. The great attraction of inter-assembly communication is that we gather around one person, the person of Christ. That's what produces fellowship among assemblies. They were all gathered to him and to him alone. And an assembly truly gathered in his name will have everything in that assembly in keeping with that name. What honors the name? What delights the name? If something is brought in and we feel that doesn't delight his name, it's not in keeping with the character of his name and person. And so fellowship between two assemblies. How lovely that is. Now let us look at the advance of Antioch. It became the home assembly of Paul at this time. Verse 1, chapter 13, there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Here's the overseers in this assembly now. Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius, Manium, and Paul and Saul. These men. I mentioned the other night that the, the tabulation of names and the acts is very beautiful. He calleth the stars by their names. And he knows the name of everyone in this assembly. But in Acts 1, all the names of those at the prayer meeting are mentioned. In Acts 1, their names are mentioned. The Lord looks down, he, he knows every name that was at the prayer meeting. In Acts 7, there are deacons at Jerusalem. And they're all named. The Lord knows the names of every deacon in God's assembly. Are you one serving deacon? Every man that serves in the assembly, even giving out hymn books, temporal deaconship, appointed by the elder brethren. Deacons who are our servants and in temporal things, writing a letter to a servant, entrusted with the task which should be given to deacons. They need, a man, an elder does deacon's work. A deacon can't be an elder, but an elder can appoint a deacon. There are deacons that are appointed by the oversight to do material things, to write letters, to care for people, to go and do something for the assembly. I hope that you will be a deacon, young man, that, that you will want to serve and that the assembly will put confidence in you to, that uh, give you a little job to do. And then by and by, you'll be a spiritual deacon. See, as I stand here, I'm a deacon. I'm doing deacon's work. The Lord Jesus was a deacon. He was a servant. A spiritual deacon is one that opens the scriptures and helps the people of God. He may not be an overseer. He may not be an elder in the assembly, but he's a deacon. And we need deacons in the assembly. And so in Acts 7, the names of the deacons are mentioned. They have honorable mention. When we come to chapter 20, tomorrow evening perhaps, we'll see the names of those who sat down at the Lord's Supper. He named them. The visitors that were there were all named and where they came from. The Lord takes account of those who sit at the supper. When you, every time you sat at the supper, your name is in heaven. There's a young man at the supper. There's a young man as a deacon. There's a sister as a deaconess. 
You say, are there deaconesses? Yes. There are sisters that do sisters' work. And there are sisters also that are shepherdesses. You never hear about the shepherdesses. Brother said to me, why was Joseph such a wonderful shepherd? I said, because his father was a shepherd, but his mother was a shepherd. She came with the father's flock. And I believe in that Dorcas was a shepherd, a deacon. She made garments for the poor. And I believe that Phoebe was a deacon. Brother said to me, I would never entrust a sister with anything. He didn't like sisters, but I'm not like that. I want to tell you, there are godly sisters. And Paul wrote a letter, the greatest letter in the Bible, the Roman epistle. And he gave it to a woman. And he said, carry that letter to the Roman assembly. Would you have done it? Say, I don't think so. Well, he did it. Brother said to me, Paul was a woman hater. No. Paul gave sisters their rightful place. And in God's assembly, every sister is important. Don't think that you don't mean anything to the Lord. Every sister is important in the assembly. And every married sister is doubly important because you can tell your husband things that I couldn't tell your husband. When he rises and gives out the wrong hymn, you could say, you know, I don't think your hymn was really in keeping. I don't say that. He'd be offended forever. But you see, each of us need a wife. And if we haven't got a wife, we're glad we have a mother or a sister or a mother in Israel. And so we look at the assembly and the names. But when we come to this chapter, it's the names of the elders, the names of the teachers at Antioch. Now it's half past eight, I could continue to midnight, but I would like to be invited back, so we'll have a little word of prayer, shall we?